Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's going very well, actually. Great. Great to hear. Um, okay, so we do have quorum, so I will call this meeting to order, and uh, I'd like to, oh, okay, Mike will be late as well. Um, we would like to recognize that collectively we are meeting from the unceded territories of all the First Nations within our regional boundaries, and we are grateful to be here. Could I have someone move approval of the agenda for the Committee of the Whole, moved by Director DeMere, seconded by Director Birch-Jones. Uh, anyone opposed? Motion carries. Could I have someone move uh, the resolution regarding uh, Ministerial Order 192? Moved by Director Rainbow, seconded by Director Elliott. Is there anyone opposed? And motion carries. And we are now on the regional moment for Area C. Director Mack. Thank you. This won't, this won't be a long drawn out affair. <clears throat> Anyways, I just wanted to say uh, driving around um, the other day in the Pemberton Valley, uh, it was nice to see uh, spring is definitely here. All the farmers are out in their fields and calves are being born and Mike got his chickens. And um, a lot of the farms too are shipping their seed potatoes from last year. So that's good. There's obviously a market still uh, for those guys. And that, that's good. Um, logging's happening throughout the area. That, that I don't know if you guys follow the... Uh, the stock market, but uh, the price of lumber right now is, I, I believe, at an all-time record. I said over twelve hundred dollars, uh, which is uh, is huge. So that's that's really good for the area and good for the people that are working. Um, I was down at the Anderson Lake dock. I met with uh, Allison down there to go over uh, putting porta potties there for the summertime, and uh, there's people. Uh, quite a number of people actually using the facility already. So that's gonna be interesting to see how that all goes. Um, as we were talking about yesterday with the influx of people and now that they've combined Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health, that's the whole lower mainland that uh, can head this way. So that's gonna be quite a challenge, I think. Uh, we'll just have to see what happens and hope for the best. Um, we talked about yesterday somewhat about road maintenance or lack of, and um, I've had uh, discussions with uh, our MLA and, uh, and he's been talking to the, the highways minister because the, um, we're just not getting the service we were getting and uh, the, the roads are getting to a point where they're gonna beyond fixing uh, you know, in a, in a small fashion. And I've noticed, as I said yesterday, the highway south now is not being maintained to the level it was when it was under warranty. So that's gonna be a challenge for all of us. Um, and the other thing uh, I guess is the, uh, with this, uh, the COVID vaccine uh, issue, um, Saturn and I got ours now uh, two weeks ago, and we had a challenge at first getting registered, but once we did, uh, the actual event itself at the community center was very well done. I mean, the people there were so professional, and you were just in and out of there, and, and it was really good. So I'm hoping that continues, and I'm sure it will. I know the lady that's in charge of it, and she's a very... Uh, a very intelligent person and is a good manager. So that should all go good. Um, the other thing, oh, as I mentioned, um, with the backcountry stuff, uh, that's going to be interesting to see how many people are here. I've already had one complaint about uh, our campsite, uh, provincial campsite at Strawberry Point, with a lot of people camping there and garbage and, and there doesn't seem to be uh, anybody there from uh, BC Parks yet. Um, their staff is still coming on and Little Lot actually do the work there to uh, maintain it. So we'll see how that works out. Um, other than that, I haven't had any complaints so far. Um, one thing
one thing uh, I did say uh, to uh, Vivian's joy, I did drive the High Line and uh, I've never seen it as good. So we'll just hope it keeps being maintained and all that money that was spent on there went to good use. But anyways, um, I will just leave it at that and hope everybody has a good spring and summer. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think has changed about the High Line? Is it less traffic or is it more maintenance? Or is it a combination of both? Well, they spent $2 million putting gravel on it. That's, uh, so they, 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 they top dressed it from, from Darcy to Seton and uh, it's wider, put in the uh, far more drainage. The new bridge is in, that slope has been yeah, it's been remediated to a degree. It, it's still there, but it's a lot better. Um, yeah, it's just uh, all the big boulders that were <clears throat> in the road itself, they pounded them all out, took them out, leveled them out. So uh, that's the thing. And like I say, now that they've done that, we just have to keep on them to make sure that they maintain it. Otherwise, it's just going to be a waste of money because eventually all that gravel is going to end up getting pushed into the ditches on both sides. But so far, so good. And I hope they can do the same thing with the Hurley. It's just, like I said, it was $2 million that they invested in this road, plus the money for the bridge, which I believe was well over a million there too. So that's what it all comes down to is, is getting a commitment from the government to, to actually put some money in. Uh, so we'll see, uh, hopefully Sal, uh, can keep working on that. And, uh, you know, I talked to the guys on our side and I know the guy that runs the grader and, you know, he said, if he's got material, he can make that into a beautiful road, but with no material, it doesn't happen. So there it is. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for area C? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, um, we have a delegation that isn't set to start until 9.15. Um, can we do the CAO verb? Oh, go ahead, Director DeMere. Yeah, I'd just like to talk about the, uh, the price of lumber right now. And it, it, it's amazing. I, I worked in, in the sawmill industry for a lot of years, well over 25 years. So I fully understand it. And it's uh, the last I looked yesterday, it was $1,291 for a thousand board feet. And, and going back about a year now, the highest that it ever made was about 550, a thousand board feet. So it kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of how much it's gone up. And there's many things that have caused that. And the main, one of the main reasons is COVID people not traveling and, and so on and so forth. So what they've, what people are doing is they're renovating. Most of these costs come from people doing renovations on, on our houses. Just amazing. Yes, it's, uh, it's pretty astounding. Um, it's gonna you, have, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's gonna have quite an effect on uh, the concept of affordable housing, what what was possible a year ago, you know, it, it, with the price of lumber doubling, I'm sure that other supplies have gone up as well. So what we thought was uh, possibly affordable a year ago is going to be totally out of reach this year. Yeah, and these things rarely go back down, do they? <laughs> It would be so nice if we could just open our minds up to some different building, um, like there's some hemp that's being used in, in plate, like it's called hemp reet, German, and you do blocks of it. And we can certainly grow hemp in area B. That would be a boom for us. Yeah, you know, would there be any left for building? <laughs> <laughs> Part of the reason so delighted with the High Line, Russell Mack, is because when I came on as director, I started receiving some pretty vociferous complaints from the residents on that road about it. 
And I started to look into it and it was in the plan of highways <clears throat> completely independently of me squeaking about it. But it was like, they started complaining to me and the road was fixed. <laughs> I got a lot of credit for that. <laughs> so, yeah. But there's some residents there, Bernard and Mary Thor, who I'm sure you know. Um, yeah. And I might they're dear to my heart. I'm glad they have safe passage in and out now. Well, Michelle Schilling, you have to give her a lot of credit, but who I give credit to is Claire Trevina. I, I talked to her, I don't know, a number of times at UBCM. She phoned me at home a number of times and we talked about that road and the other roads, but that road in particular, you know, and she kept telling me they would get it done they would get it done and nothing ever happened and I was kind of getting disappointed as everybody else and then all of a sudden you know I get a call saying yeah the money's available and it's going to get done and then I thought wow this is really great and then she went and retired and uh and didn't run again so now we have to start all over like the new guy uh the ex education minister he seems to be pretty good too um to deal with so hopefully uh it all carries on um director clark are we ready to go great yes thank you all um so we are going to bring in our delegation at this time we have 30 minutes for this Good morning, Ms. Fresco and Mr. Vanderwall, welcome. Um, I, uh, I am very glad to have you here today and uh, we are looking forward to hearing your report from the Fraser Basin Council. You have 30 minutes for this delegation and we're happy to turn the mic over to you and hear what you have to tell us. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Chair Forge. Uh, just doing a sound check if someone can give me a thumbs up. Great. Thank you, Chair. So uh, thank you all. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be joining you from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And also uh, extending a big thank you to Director Rainbow for inviting us to present today on the Salmon Safe BC program and the Plug in BC programs that we administer. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Teresa Fresco and my role with Fraser Basin Council is the regional manager for the Greater Vancouver Sea to Sky region. And uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Jim Vanderwall, who is the director of climate change programs. I could just get the next slide. Thank you. So for those who aren't familiar with FBC, um, we are a not-for-profit organization that brings together uh, all kinds of people from diverse sectors to advance sustainability in the Fraser Basin and across BC. And our work really centers on three strategic priorities, taking action on climate change and air quality, support healthy watersheds and water resources, and building sustainable and resilient regions and communities. And within these strategic areas, we tend to play a number of roles, um, including catalyst, facilitator, educator, and program manager. And you're really gonna see uh, a lot of those roles uh, on the ground in the two programs we're gonna present about today. So next slide. So one of the other hats I, I wear in my role is I'm the program manager for the Salmon Safe BC program. Um, Salmon Safe, for those that aren't uh, um, familiar, is an eco certification program that encourages and promotes progressive land and water management practices in both urban development and agriculture operations. Next slide. And when presenting on Salmon Safe, I always like to show this photo. Uh, I think it really captures the heart and soul of what Salmon Safe is all about, which is that everything is connected and that our, our habitat is really salmon habitat as well. It's always important to remember that our communities, whether they're urban, suburban, rural, they're all shared by many different species, including salmon, and that our activities on the land do have impacts downstream no matter where we are. Next slide. 
So Salmon Safe, to give you an overview, actually started in the United States uh, in 1997 as a program of the Pacific Rivers Council nonprofit in Oregon. And over the years, it grew in popularity and became its own independent nonprofit and equal label. So we do partner with the Salmon Safe office in Oregon. Uh, Salmon Safe uh, was launched in BC in 2010 with the agriculture program and was followed by the urban program in 2013. And in addition to the Fraser Basin Council, you can see on that map in the right uh, that we're joined by a number of um, partner organizations delivering Salmon Safe across the Salish Sea as far south as California and all the way north to the state of Washington. And then of course, uh, across the border here in British Columbia. Next slide. So the Salmon Safe BC um, program consists of a number of sub programs, both certification as well as accreditation sub programs. And these include um, our farm certification, um, parks and natural areas, urban campuses, urban development, infrastructure, and then our three accreditation programs for construction developer and designer firms. Next slide. For the agriculture program to give you a quick snapshot, um, we currently have 34 sites certified in British Columbia, including 20 farms and 14 vineyards. And uh, to hone in on the SLRD region, uh, this includes three sites in Pemberton, uh, across the creek, Helmer's Organic Farm and Ice Cap Organics. And uh, we're looking for that, that number to grow as I'll get into later. Next slide. So there are essentially seven areas of focus when we look at assessing an agriculture site. And these include in-stream habitat protection restoration, riparian and wetland vegetation protection restoration, water use management, erosion prevention sediment control, integrated pest management and water quality protection. Um, we include animal management if that's applicable and then landscape level biological diversity and enhancement. Um, in terms of the process for salmon safe agriculture, um, typically if there's an interested site, we would start with a pre-assessment call to learn more about that site and its operations. And if we see the site is eligible to proceed, um, we would schedule an on-site inspection. Um, we've moved that to virtual, of course, to respect COVID protocols um, with our agriculture assessor. And then our assessor following that inspection would issue a report with their findings stating any conditions for the certification or any recommendations for further improvement. And they would submit that to the landowner. Um, and once they sign off, we, we then um, engage with our communication staff to put together a recognition campaign for the achievement of that certification. Um, agriculture certification cycle is three years and we do check in with the landowners each year to see how things are going, um, if there are any conditions, the progress of those, uh, and whether they need any additional support. Next slide. So we've had a, a number of conversations with Director Rainbow, which has been really helpful. And it's been really great to learn about how the Salmon Safe Agriculture Program has some areas of alignment with the agriculture plan goals for the SLRD area. And so I just listed them here just to acknowledge um, with the Squamish, Squamish Valley Agriculture Plan. Um, there's so much alignment with goal three with the Area C and Pemberton Valley Agriculture Area Plan. Um, goal three for that one as well, as well as the Area B Lillooet and Statlium Agriculture Plan. So we just see a lot of alignment with the, the process and the standards that we undergo through the Salmon Safe BC program. Next slide. So on the urban development side, to give you a snapshot, we have three certified sites in BC, including the Mountain Equipment Co-op Head Office, uh, the YVR Airport, and uh, the Mountain Equipment Co-op Flagship Store. Uh, we do have uh, six sites in progress, and those include the Southlands development in Delta, which is led by Century Group, the First Nations Health Authority, um, the administration building for the Lower Mainland, um, which is in North Vancouver, uh, Albert Street, which is a residential development in Port Moody, Keith Drive in Vancouver, and uh, for those of you who uh, are familiar with Nature's Path, that's going to be the future head office. And we're excited about the Inglewood Campus of Care um, site in West Vancouver, which is actually a senior care facility and one of the first that is undergoing a, a salmon safe process here in Canada. And we've also expanded our geographic reach outside of the lower mainland and our first site in on Vancouver Island is going to be the Telus Ocean um, uh, site in Victoria. Next slide. 
In terms of the urban development areas of focus, we, we do consider five core areas and two context specific standards uh, when assessing a site on the urban side. And these include stormwater management, water use management, erosion and uh, sediment control, pesticide reduction and water quality protection and um, biodiversity or the enhancement of urban ecological function. And when a water course flows through the site, um, two more trigger, uh, standards are triggered, and that includes the in-stream habitat protection and restoration and the riparian wetland vegetation protection and restoration standards. Next slide. So although Salmon Safe is its own standalone certification, it does have complementarity with other certification programs um, out there. Uh, the strongest complementarity is with the, the LEED certification that you may have heard of. Um, if you are pursuing LEED as well as Salmon Safe and you're successful in getting your Salmon Safe certification, it actually can translate into a bonus point under the innovation and design category for LEED. And we find that that's quite an incentive for developers. But it also has complementarity with other uh, programs such as Envision, Living Building Challenge, Built Green, and Sustainable Sites. Next slide. So three aspects of the certification scope to keep in mind is that uh, assessments can be conducted for buildings that are in the design phase, which is preferable because at the early stage you can always make changes. Um, but that being said, it can also um, be done for buildings that are completed or existing. Site inspections are also undertaken by an independent BC-based assessment team. Uh, we usually deploy three to four experts in the areas of stormwater, aquatic biology, hydrology, watershed management, landscape architecture, and integrated pest management. And you'll see that those professions align with the standards. And our standards are also uh, peer reviewed um, by the science and academic community and are based on the biological needs of salmon. So there are six steps to the urban development process. Similar to the agriculture process, it usually starts with a, a conversation with the, the developer or landowner about the project and it gives us an opportunity to present on the Salmon Safe program. And uh, following that call, if we find that the site is eligible, we would proceed with something called a pre-assessment review where we would ask for a number of documents um, uh, on the site and then we would use those documents to do an assessment on the areas of alignment with the salmon safe standards and areas that could use some further improvement and we would submit a, a pre-assessment memo as an output of that section and then following that um, once it usually happens around the construction phase we would um, undergo a comprehensive site assessment and do an inspection of course, during COVID, um, we are now uh, transitioning this to a virtual environment. Um, following the on-site assessment or virtual assessment, we would then issue a report of our team's findings and any conditions or recommendations for certification. And then upon the acceptance of that report and sign off, that would be um, considered a certified site. And then we would come together with their communications team to put together a publicity recognition campaign. Um, the certification cycle for the urban program is five years and uh, similar to agriculture, we do do an annual check in on the progress on any conditions, uh, as well as recommendations. Next slide. And similar to the agriculture program, um, we're finding that there is areas of alignment with um, some of the goals in the regional growth strategy, as well as the integrated sustainability plan um, for the SLRD, uh, among other regions that we work in. Um, and in particular, we found that goal five was a, a nice area of alignment with the Salmon Safe Urban Program um, and, and all of the points, I won't read them all, under the goal five, um, we found fit quite nicely with our standards. Next slide. So uh, just an acknowledgement that um, if you are interested, I know we will have some time for Q&A, but if you're interested in learning more about the Salmon Safe program, we do have a refurbished website. I encourage you to visit. It has a lot of resources and, and information. Um, it's salmonsafe.ca. And uh, we also have a, a quite a large social media spread that you can also get connected. So with that, I'll, I'll end my presentation and uh, would like to pass it on to my colleague, Jim Vanderwall. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so I, if I could have the next slide, please. And the next slide. And the next slide. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about our sustainable transportation programs. 
Um, there's a lot going on, um, but I'll try to give some highlights of work that we're doing under uh, the banner of Plugin BC, uh, which is a program of the Fraser Basin Council, um, our emotive outreach program, uh, the public charger program, um, EV advisors uh, available for MERBs and workplaces for, for multi-unit residential buildings, uh, the specialty use vehicle incentive and uh, go electric fleets. So there's quite a lot of different names here, but really it's this is um, uh, a way to try and reach into different aspects, different areas of BC, different sectors to help uh, people get on board. Next slide, please. So um, this is a program with Fraser Basin Council. It's really, um, we've been doing this for many years, ever since the first vehicles arrived in BC and have been collaborating with uh, a number of different um, organizations to try and really accelerate um, EV uptake in BC and provide information. <clears throat> and I think that type of approach, which, you know, other, we're not the only ones obviously working in this space, but the collaborative approach that's apparent in BC has been really successful in, uh, in terms of where we've gotten so far. Next slide. Um, we, so we recently um, have uh, new legislation, um, which is driving this behind the scenes, the regulations and the Zero Emissions Vehicle Act. And um, you can see that, um, you know, there's some initial targets of 10% by 2025. We're almost there already in 2020, 9% uh, of all light duty vehicles. Um, so that includes cars, passenger cars and light duty trucks um, are electric. And uh, given the fact that we don't have electric pickup trucks in the market yet, that's quite a, an astounding figure, um, especially given um, uh, the kind of vehicle sales that people saw last year with, uh, with COVID hitting us. Uh, next, please. Um, so we're really seeing electric vehicles to be, you know, moving into the mainstream, um, significant growth uh, since even over the last two to three years. Um, we're seeing local governments um, in particular get really involved in terms of um, supportive things, zoning bylaws for EV parking in areas, not just in uh, Metro Vancouver, um, but uh, all over the province, Sandwich, Nelson, Squamish are some examples. And a number of communities are also developing their own kind of local strategies. Uh, next. Next slide. Um, so, um, Beyond just the legislation, um, we have, of course, the purchase rebates, uh, point of sale for when you buy the vehicle, which uh, BC and Government of Canada support. Uh, with charging infrastructure, there are um, home and work-based charging policies and incentives available. Um, of course, most importantly, there's more and more types of vehicles becoming available to support people in what they, uh, how they use their vehicles and, uh, and education outreach is also important. Next. So uh, one of the, uh, our areas of focus is on education and outreach. Uh, we do this under the emotive banner and it's really about helping people understand the electric vehicle experience. And um, you know, that's uh, changed over time uh, from when we first launched the campaign. Uh, next, please. Um, the conversation really is changing. Um, when this first launched, it was about, um, you know, a new thing that people were becoming aware of. Now, um, many people are aware. Uh, most people say that they know somebody who has a, you know, they've seen a vehicle, they know people that drive vehicles. There's more opportunities available. So people are looking for more detailed information um, about, uh, about how this works. Next, please. Um, so we work uh, in communities across BC. Um, we have a, a network of ambassadors, EV ambassadors, volunteers that help to uh, communicate and do outreach at events. And um, importantly, um, over the last um, couple of years, we've been able to, uh, with support from the province, to provide small uh, community outreach incentives of five or ten thousand dollars. Of course, again, that's gone virtual over the last year, but traditionally that's been events um, and our focus is on events and activities outside of the lower mainland. So everything from you know, test drives, um, displays at the farmer's markets or others, other activities, videos, 
and it's uh, it's great to see a number of different communities uh, getting on board. Um, and in fact, that funding call is is open at the moment um, for any communities that are interested in uh, in applying. Next. Uh, there's also a website, of course, um, the Emoto website, which has uh, a lot of information and tools around around this to help support uh, outreach in, in different areas. And um, we've recently tried to, again, provide different types of outreach um, materials and, and collateral, uh, both uh, focused on BC's different you know, communities, different cultural communities, as well as um, issues uh, of interest to places uh around bc you know cold weather issues how do you how do these things perform in the winter those kinds of things next please and for social media i'll just go to the next slide sorry you got a few too many on this one next please um our program i'd like to spend a little bit of time on i'm sure there there'll be some questions perhaps about this um is the public charger program so this is for um the fast chargers that you see on the highway or in communities that are intended you know mainly to support travel between communities although we also know people do um, use them who may not have charging available at home but most people charge at home it's you know 80 to 90 percent of what what happens it's convenient but when people want to you know uh, come to your region from elsewhere um, they're going to be looking for public charging so this is um, funding that's available to support that uh, next slide um, with support from, from BC. Um, so right now we have approximately um, uh, uh, $5.7 million. There's funding available for um, 80 fast chargers and as well um, 60 level two chargers. So the, the slower speed ones, but just as a backup, we always wanna have redundancy available for folks um, in the network. So the, the focus of this program is really to fill gaps um, focusing on um, <clears throat> rural and uh, remote communities, as well as uh, urban centers where there may be um, high EV adoption and, and people don't have charging at home. Next, please. So uh, we do have um, the incentives here. Uh, there's a table, you know, based on the power of the station, uh, the incentive goes up. As well, I'd like to point out that the maximum incentive available is uh, significantly higher for Indigenous communities. Um, simply because there is a, you know, a less opportunity for um, existing capital funds to be directed to these types of projects. Um, and we have seen good interest um, uh, from around BC. Um, I can't, because some of this is still under review, I can't really speak to the details, but there's definitely been good interest from the Squamish Little Regional District area as well, which is great to see uh, given, you know, the importance of, of travel up and down, um, particularly the Sea to Sky Corridor, but of course uh, throughout the region. Next, please. And this just gives you an idea of, you know, this is the network that we're trying to fill out. You can see, obviously, the density is in the urban centers, and we're trying to help uh, expand that network beyond into uh, all the corners of British Columbia that people want to travel to. Next, please. Um, another um, support that's available is um, support for uh, <coughs> workplaces and uh, multi-unit residential uh, buildings for residents there, stratas and apartments. Um, so we know that, um, you know, the actual technical part of installing a charger in these buildings is, you know, there's some uh, obviously um, knowledge involved in that and, and so forth, but we know that um, there's also a need to provide uh, guidance around that. How do people work with their stratas to, um, to deal with this? Uh, sometimes there are questions around this and how it works. And so um, we, to complement the you know, incentives that are available through the utilities for these chargers, we have uh, right now two uh, people on staff who are available to help navigate um, workplaces and, and stratas and apartment owners through the process. And uh, you know, we know that um, that's been very helpful in terms of uh, getting people through the the steps of, of getting charging in these buildings and again given you know the hundreds of thousands of uh, strata residents that we have in BC and the importance of home charging this uh, this will continue to be important for, for some time given the number of buildings out there next please uh, 
another program which um, this is for the specialty use vehicle incentive. So it's a bit of a, <laughs> an odd name, but um, it's really uh, think of it as an incentive for anything other than a light duty car or pickup truck. So everything from motorcycles and e-cargo bikes up to buses and trucks. Um, and so these are, you know, again, these are incentives that are available to help buy down the cost. Um, we're seeing many different types of things available, you know, everything, <laughs> uh, even electric Zambonis for clearing the ice. So um, it's great to see uh, all the options that are out there and things that people are able to uh, take advantage of here. And um, there are additional incentives, you know, around the kind of COVID recovery uh, funding that came out in the in the fall. So we've been able to offer additional incentives, especially for the larger vehicles, which is which is great to see. Next, please. Uh, so some examples, you know, motorcycles are uh, um, $2,000 is available to help buy down the cost uh, cargo e bikes for for fleets for businesses of up to $1,700. Next. Um, and there are incentives then for the next size of vehicles, things like low, low speed uh, trucks and ice resurfacers. Um, and then for larger um, on road vehicles, up to $100,000 for buses and delivery trucks, um, and a variety of other things that you can see there. So, uh, next. Uh, final program to talk about is. Uh, specific support around fleets. So, you know, these are, what's a fleet? It's really, it's a collection of vehicles that's that's owned and operated by a business or a, a local government, um, whomever, a public sector organization, First Nation. And so there are, again, a variety of different supports available. There's a person uh, as your emission fleet advisor who can help uh, navigate people through their questions and process. There's money available to do assessments of the existing fleet to identify opportunities. There's money available to look at facilities. So sort of plan for, for charging infrastructure. Uh, there's money for electrical upgrades and then and, and money as well for, um, for the charging itself. So um, again, this is, you know, we're seeing this as an important area to support uh, in order to um, expand the use of electric vehicles. And we know uh, local governments have been, you know, at the forefront of this from the beginning. And uh, you know we've again seen lots of lots of interest from local governments in uh, participating in this program and receiving this type of support. Thanks, please. So uh, at this point, I think this concludes our presentation, and Teresa and I are available for discussion and questions. Are there any questions from anyone on the board? Thank you very much for that great presentation. Both presentations were excellent. Um, Director DeMere, go ahead. This is a question for Jim. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, when you talk about rural remote, uh, we live in the Goldbridge area, which is north of uh, Pemberton and west of Lillooet. And I've had a few con constituents ask me about uh, EV charging station in our little remote area. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Lillooet also would have to have them in Pemberton to be able to make that drive affordable. We do have a lot of tourists and visitors come into our area. So what are the possibilities of a very remote area like ours? Certainly, yeah, it's, um, I know, uh, I don't think this is a secret. I think BC Hydro is already planning some charging in Lillooet and Pemberton. I don't know if they've broken ground yet on those, but. I know they've already shown up on the on the plug share map, which is the sort of the Google for um, for uh, charging stations. Um, but yeah, our program has you know we've talked to all kinds of people in different corners of BC. Uh, had you know conversations with uh, Il Cacho First Nation and Anaheim Lake. They're even more remote than you are, I I, I believe. Uh, they're off the grid, uh, so you know it's available to anyone who is interested, and and certainly that. Uh, that um, in order for people to have, you know, some good options between Pemberton and, and Lillooet, it would make sense that, that, you know, your location would be, would be considered or that, you know, if there's interest in someone uh, applying to the program um, by all means, or we can have a separate conversation if you like to sort of get into more detail. Yeah, 
I've got one more comment. Uh, I've recently been looking at uh, at a new ATV or a side by side, and and uh, and I see in your program you got funding for those too. And there are what I've been looking at specifically is electric, mm -hmm. and and I've had a constituent also talk about boat motors. So uh, they make boat motors now electric up to ten horsepower. So. Um, would boat, boat motors also be, um, have a discount for them also? Um, yeah, we haven't had that added to our, you know, sort of, we have a list of, of, you know, the vehicles that are available. We haven't, you know, con kind of gotten into the marine side of things, um, but we have had a few inquiries. So it's something we continue to raise with the province about, you know, which, you know, which ones might need incentives. I mean, we know people have had, small um, electric motors for years. So there's probably not, you know, there's probably a very um, robust uh, market for that. And, you know, the incentives are intended to help new products that are yet, you know, there's a barrier for people to buy them. Um, but for these larger ones, um, it's something that I think should be, uh, should be uh, considered um, because definitely that's an area where, um, you know, electric can also play a role. Okay, thank you. I see Director Elliott, go ahead. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. Um, do you forecast that um, the rebates for buying electric vehicles will keep up with demand? Like, are you guys sort of plotting out what demand looks like? Because we're exceeding our expectations, um, but the rebates have been part of driving that. So do you see those two things staying? Um, on, there's enough budget to keep those two things aligned. <laughs> That's always a good question. Uh, it does seem like for now that that is the case. Um, you know, I think eventually the goal is that we reach a point where incentives aren't needed for these types of vehicles. Prices are, you know, comparable. Uh, we know already that on a life cycle basis that there's a, you know, case to be made for going EV, but that doesn't always work when you get around the, on the dealer lot and you're thinking about what to buy and you've got to put more money down. So, um, right now, I think there was, um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I, uh, looking at the BC budget, there was additional money. Um, you know, it's, it's not, um, broken down in the, what I've seen, but there was additional money for the clean BC, um, go electric, um, incentives, or at least the overall program. So I don't see that going away anytime soon, but, uh, yeah. Good and then how do we, um, how do we address um, low income families? Like, has there been any thought to increasing the rebates for um, people on lower incomes that, that still need a car? Yeah, it's something we've, we've asked ourselves about. I mean, uh, we're not as involved in that side of it. Those incentives are delivered by the new car dealers. Um, there are some jurisdictions that have, um, for example, they also have incentives for used vehicles, you know, probably not as big because the, the cost isn't as high, uh, which are generally targeted to um, lower income, or it's, you know, it's ten, tends to have some benefit for uh, lower income families. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it, it is something we need to be thinking about because obviously uh, there is a, there is a, an equity issue here around who's buying vehicles right now. And, you know, especially as we get closer to, you know, more and more vehicles becoming electric, uh, we may have some issues in terms of who's still kind of stuck with, with gas and diesel vehicles and maybe higher costs as the cost of fuel go up and those kinds of things. So um, in the early stages, you know, it's really trying to get the market going. But now I think we're at a more mature stage where we need to be being um, a little bit more nuanced in some of our, our work. So I, I appreciate that comment. I think to that point too, it uh, you see a lot further distance for commuting for people that, you know, we see that like we're seeing that there's a lot more commuting from Fraser Valley into Vancouver um, and typically lower, lower paid workers are doing further commuting. So it's, it's a bit, uh, it's concerning, certainly value looking at that. Um, I have Director Stoner and then Director Birch Jones. Thank you, through the chair. Thanks so much to both of you for the great presentations and for being here today. Um, I have two questions, one for Teresa and one for Jim. So uh, Teresa, on the Salmon Safe certification programs, I'm wondering if you have 
a cost range, both from an agricultural perspective and from the urban development perspective, um, or just even like how those fees are structured, if it's based on size or. Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, yes, it does depend for the agriculture program. And I also may shoulder tap uh, Director Rainbow who's been working with me on this. Um, there is a different fee schedule for farms versus vineyards. Uh, and that is largely to the obvious um, in terms of ability to pay. Um, so uh, in terms of the, how we structure the fee schedule for vineyards, it depends on the tonnage of output. Um, so we have three kind of categories of that, and then that would determine which fee schedule they would have for the sort of three year certification. So that's the other thing, they don't have to pay per year. We give them one price and that is for the whole three years. And the renewal process, if they'd like to renew after three years for both vineyards and farms, there's obviously efficiencies because we now know the site. Um, so there is much more cheaper rate for renewal. And then for farms, um, you know, this is still an ongoing um, assessment that we're doing, but we really uh, scale that back in terms of ability to pay. So obviously, if you have a small operation, um, there's a, a different ability to pay versus like a large scale, um, well healed operation. So we try to accommodate as best we can. But one of the things that um, D Director Rainbow and I have been talking about is, you know, is there supports out there to subsidize um, uh, for farms and, and smaller scale operations that may not um, be able to afford the three year certification rate. Um, and also that being said, I mean, everything is mostly cost recoverable. Uh, so we're not trying to, you know, make a profit off of farmers or anything like that. It's really just to cover the cost of the staff support as well as our assessor. On the urban side, it's a bit different because we are dealing with developers. Um, so obviously the ability to pay is, is much different and the success of the urban program is, is uh, really important for Salmon Safe BC because it helps also support the agriculture program or maybe trying to create incentives um, for ag through the urban. So for urban development, um, how we structure the fee schedule is largely dependent on the level of complexity of the site. So if, you're, if you have a lot line to lot line, smaller site, um, obviously the price will be much more streamlined because there's not as much documents to review, um, not much for the on-site walkthrough uh, or virtual walkthrough, if you will. Um, whereas a, a community-wide multi-phase development, that's obviously a higher level of complexity, which would require um, a lot more effort on the part of our assessment team as well as staff support. And so the, the fee would be you know, structured to enable that complexity and that review. So I know I'm not giving you numbers. Um, and, and the reason for that is just managing some expectations because we try to meet people where they're at, um, especially on the agriculture side. Uh, and then on the urban side, it's, it's just so hard because every site is so different and we, we're not a checklist kind of certification. We're really site specific. So we try to take it you know, in terms of the, the site context. Director Amo, I don't know if, it, if it's okay to shoulder tap you, if you had any comments just on our initial conversations on the ag program and, and fees. I, I had no idea starting out with whether the, um, the, the staff and, and the, the people running the ag program would, would be interested. I'm really, uh, happy with the, the the kind of response that we've had, and, and also the response from uh, from farmers. So I, I think uh, th th this particular area, I think there are a lot of people that are um, very much uh, in sort of in line with the the kind of uh, goals that um, Fraser Basin the, the Council is, is promoting. Um, we have a lot of people really concerned about the environment and and, uh, and future. And so if we get these programs in place now, then um, it, just has a, it, has a, it has a benefit to all of us. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. That's great. I guess just as a follow up on that, um, I'm, if you've been connected with Director Rainbow, I'm assuming you have had the opportunity to connect through the Squamish Food Policy Council, the Lillooet Agricultural Food yep. Secure Society. So those connections have all been made. Yes. Great, yes, fantastic. Absolutely. It's been and a great I, connection, yeah. Great, uh, and then I had a quick question for Jim. Just uh, we, a few years ago, we brought forward a resolution um, from the District of Squamish on um, 
tax exemptions for e-bicycles. So e-bikes kind of fell through the cracks where you had uh, regular bicycles and tricycles were not uh, taxed provincially. Uh, and then there were a whole bunch of incentives around e-vehicles, um, but there was no incentives around e-bicycles and they were being taxed provincially. Um, and I'm just curious if you have any insight on whether uh, I do know it was in one of the minister's mandate letters to actually move the provincial sales tax, if there's been any advances uh, on that file. Yeah, well, it's good timing. Um, the provincial budget included an exemption for e-bikes um, for PST, so that's a start uh, for both e-bikes and for e-cargo bikes. So uh, yeah, there's no at this point, there's no additional incentive beyond that, but uh, it's a start. And um, I know we get questions like daily and weekly about e-bikes um, given, you know, we're one of the few places where you can actually email or contact somebody, you know, you know, you don't know who to contact in the government. So we get that question regularly and we certainly, you know, I, I, I get it. And, um, you know, a number of us do have e-bikes and it's certainly very affordable getting back to the other question around affordability and options for people who can't afford a new vehicle. So um, yeah, it's certainly, I think, um, those continuing to uh, sort of um, press for that, those options is, is uh, it sounds like some of it's getting through with the changes that you've seen for PST and hopefully perhaps in the future, there's other incentives available. That's great. I'd missed that part of the budget. So thanks for the update. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Director Birch Jones. Thank you um, to the chair. Thank you for your presentation. It's great work. Um, I'm one of your ambassadors up here, Lilo at BC, I've got in one of the early electric Volkswagens and we have a charger and solar panels on the roof. So I can buzz around essentially for free at this point. And it's, I'm a great example. I talk it up a lot, um, but the costs getting into it were steep. So I'm happy that that's been raised. Um, it's, uh, also, I'm glad you're in touch with our Lillooet Agriculture and Food Society because that's a really important, thriving organization with our agriculture sector here. Something about the Volkswagen, there's a lot of pickup trucks in Lillooet. And there's a lot of guys that are looking to go electric and I get a lot of questions, but I cannot deny, there's, there's not some good models that are suitable for here yet. And we do have a fast charger in the works. Apparently it's been in the works for like three years now, to my knowledge, it's still not installed. I have a slow charger at home, which works perfectly. Um, the battery life, when you start getting to 20 below winters, which we still have here um, and North even more so is severely affected. So it's just something that you can't kind of underestimate as a, as a barrier now, along with the cost. The battery life is like at least a third cut. Um, that's, a, that's quite a consideration for range for practical purposes. And so just that comment and yeah, thank you for your good work. Any other questions from anybody else? I have a question. Um, we recently um, heard from our fleet department at the resort municipality of Whistler that um, the changeover to uh, bringing more electric vehicles into the fleet um, is actually surprisingly expensive to change over the tools to maintain those vehicles because they all have to be grounded and insulated and and that's a rather large expense for a municipality or for a local government to make those um, big changes, if, especially if you were considering, um, you know, for transit fleets to be switched over and for those maintenance departments to make those um, transfers of different tools. Like it's, a, it's something I certainly had never thought about. Um, it's a whole training regime. It's, it's you know, there it's changing the way we maintain vehicles. And so I'm curious, um, is there any discussion around um, helping that transition? Because it's one thing to buy the vehicles, but uh, to retrain your mechanics and, and um, change over that whole process is quite expensive, so. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's there's been discussion about it. I'm not as familiar with 
the details, um, but that's something I could certainly touch base with our um, fleet advisor on to see if there's been, uh, you know, he's been, we had some delays in launching that program after the provincial election. Um, so it, it came a bit late. Um, so, but he's, you know, he's been talking to people over the last couple of months. Um, so I'd be interested to see what other others have to say. I know, I mean, some, some um, organizations that have EVs would tend to, you know, rely on dealers for that maintenance rather than doing it in-house because it is, you know, maybe it's, um, uh, at this point, not the majority of their vehicles or it's, you know, it's sort of a specialty, but I can mm -hmm. see over time, like, you know, if you, if we're encouraging people to do this, eventually that's going to be an in-house activity for, for municipalities, um, and certainly transit fleets, um, uh, it would be in any case. So yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for raising that. I'll, I'll certainly pass that on. And, um, if you'd like me to follow up, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from anybody? at all no i'll go ahead director rainbow yeah i just want to say thank you to Teresa and, and jim for coming and, and making this presentation so but you know when i first um, got involved uh i looked at some things that i thought would be would work really well in area d and had some conversations with developers and with farmers and, and so on and and, um, and as Teresa said she, she's um we, we've had some success in in moving forward with that um, and as she so showed in, in her presentation, there's a real alignment between what um, the Fraser Basin Council goals are in these two areas uh, compared to what we are wanting to do as a, a regional district. And um, so I, I just thought it would be useful for my colleagues in the other rural areas to, to hear about these programs. And, and I hope there'll be some uptake there. So thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Jim. See you soon. Wonderful. Well, yes, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for the work that you do. Um, it is uh, making our province a better place. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for the we'll, opportunity. Appreciate it. We'll see you again soon. Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye. All right. Thank you all. Um, we are now on 6.1 CAO verbal update. Thank you, Chair. Nothing this morning. Okay. Uh, great. Um, okay, I, uh, well, I'm 7.1, uh, Chair's verbal update. Um, I just wanted to touch on uh, two um, sessions that I attended in the last month since our last meeting. And uh, one of them was the um, CAO CEO conference uh, hosted um, by UBCM for the regional district uh, chairs and CAOs. It was uh, two days, two half days. Um, and there were lots of really amazing um, programs. So essentially each chair and CAO uh, reported on something that uh, their area was working on in the last year. Um, we reported about the Sea to Sky Trail and the progress through uh, Gord's Garden and uh, really just the expansive trail network that uh, our region is quite proud of. Um, oh, what else was there? There was uh, some really good sessions with uh, a lawyer talking about conflict of interest and how that affects directors and um, and the, basically the changing landscape of um, our participation in local government and what it means for each director to be aware of. Uh, I thought that was really uh, useful. It was uh, Souk from Young Anderson reported on that. We had a report from the MFA uh, chair, Malcolm Brody, um, regarding, um, it was sort of a, a recap of the MFA conference, which was the week prior to that, and how local government is responding to COVID and how um, 
many of the grants that we are able to access are helping us get back on track and keep our communities whole um, through a really challenging year. So um, I think we're, we're all well, well <laughs> on our way to understanding the different granting opportunities there. Um, what else was there? Um, CAO Helmer, did you want to share the Fraser Valley Regional District, uh, their take on the CEDAR app, um, website that they shared with us? Uh, thank you, Chair. Sure, sure. I will do that. Thank you. Um, the Fraser Valley Regional District has a program that they set up, it's called cedarnetwork.ca. You could Google it and um, they use it as a tool for networking and collaborating with First Nations. Um, it started because they wanted to know the key people that they needed to deal with and were finding it cumbersome just having contact lists and having contacts changed, but they wanted it to be something more than that. So they've built into it an ability to um, to network with the First Nations for the member municipalities and the member uh, First Nations to contact each other, to know about each other, to know different initiatives, uh, different projects that they're working on. And uh, they said they've had some interest from other areas beyond their regional district, looking at exploring uh, expanding that type of program. Uh, they, at this point, they made it for their own internal needs in collaboration with the RD, the municipalities and the First Nations. But uh, they're, they're seeing that there's a, a broader interest in having similar types of uh, access to this type of tool. So it's something that um, perhaps you would be interested in taking a peek at if you have a few moments and um, it seemed quite interesting and it was quite helpful to what they were doing. Uh, then the Capital Regional District has gone through the process of uh, revising their bylaws and uh, how they're set up to encourage First Nations to be appointed to their standing and select committees and that they be compensated and participate in those committees the same as alternate directors would so on a per meeting attendance basis which they said they've just recently done and they haven't yet had uptake on but they've received favorable responses from the member first nations about the potential that they could participate in the areas that were of interest to them so that was quite interesting too thank you chair great thank you um I also found uh, really interesting, Ryan Wainwright uh, reported back on uh, some new reporting tools and collaborating tools that are available through Emergency Management BC and um, sort of streamlining the process for EOCs once the emergency strikes and uh, some new financial guidelines that um, that they're hoping to uh, tap into as we move forward through wildfire and freshet and other types of emergencies. So um, overall, it was uh, it was a good couple of days, and um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to report back on from there. Um, we had a really interesting conference with MFA. Um, Actually, it was the last uh, in March, but um, we had um, an economist report back on how, uh, uh, what's the word, discretionary spending in the average Canadian is, is quite a bit different. Uh, most people have saved about 20% over the last year, which means that uh, the floodgates will open when people can start to travel um, and spend on things that they haven't been able to spend money on for the last year, eating out, travel, um, recreation, those floodgates are, are going to open and it will be profound um, more than anything we've seen in the last 20 years. Uh, so that was really interesting just to see kind of the mechanics of how uh, they see, um, you know, people have, um, 
been taking advantage of lower interest rates on uh, mortgage rates and and that kind of thing. So um, just the changing changing demographic of where people are spending their money is is really interesting. So that is my chair's report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, go ahead, Director Rainbow. Uh, you, you mentioned um, at the beginning there a presentation about conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is there anything you can share with us? Is there a document at all? Or, I'm just wondering if any, anything has changed uh, that we should be aware of. Uh, yes, I will send through, I believe, yeah, I, I'll send through the, the, uh, the handout to you. Um, and I, I know that there will be a session on it at uh, UBCM this year. So, um, but ultimately I think that there's just a heightened awareness around each of our own responsibility to know where our conflicts lie. And um, I think they're always just sort of wanting to remind us to be hypervigilant about conflict. And um, if you're at all in doubt, I think the, the big takeaway is if you're ever in doubt, then check it out kind of thing. Cause you don't want to um, neglect that responsibility as a as a local government official. But yes, I'll send you I'll send you through some information on that. Thank you. Thank you. And Director Demare, go ahead. Was there any discussion uh, at that meeting that uh, uh, CEO Helmer and you attended on code of conduct? Um, was there? I, they've actually, UBCM spent about a year with a, with a working group and created a conflict, uh, sorry, a code of conduct document, uh, which was just released yesterday. I'll send that through as well. Um, it is extensive and it's really interesting in light of, uh, censures in other, in other jurisdictions, um, there are counselors that have been in the news recently um, going through um, going through some really challenging times with not only uh, counselor to counselor or or um, I think there's less uh, awareness around the um, count, you know kind of the internal politics on councils, but. Uh, community members and code of conduct uh, with local governments. So I think that that would, this code of conduct document will be really interesting uh, for everyone to read. And um, we could certainly, um, yeah, I'm happy to share that out with you for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Seeing none. Uh, is there any late business for this session, Director Clark or CEO Helmer? No. Okay. Um, all right. Could I have someone make a motion that we move into close? Director Rainbow, seconded by Director Crompton. Is there anyone opposed? Motion carries. Um, and you want to take us into another link? 